Thank you so much, guys, for being here with us this evening. Um, now, when we talk about elections, I don't think we talk enough about how important informed citizens are to the process of democracy. And when citizens and voters cease to have access to truth, to credible information, to information that they can rely on based on which they can make their electoral choices, it subverts democracies in more ways that we can count. I don't think I need to break it to any of you here that we live in times where we are bombarded with fake news, divisive propaganda, hateful propaganda. The source of this can be, you know, your favorite primetime anchor on your favorite primetime channel. It could be WhatsApp, YouTube, Twitter. And so this session is very important, especially because we're going to be facing a relentless election cycle in India. Before the general elections, we have about six state elections and of course the big 2024 general elections. So to set the tone of this panel, I think it would be nice to first have each of our very distinguished panels here just to give us a little lowdown on what uh, misinformation can really do to democracy. So maybe we can start with Lyric, and then we go to Minakshi, and then we come to you. Five minutes each on um, how disinformation, misinformation corrodes constitutional democracy. Oh, absolutely. Thank you uh, <laughs> for having me um, over here. And I'll certainly try and be brief because we're all waiting for dinner, I guess, next. So, um, y yes, um, democracies have this kind of fundamental vulnerability in them, which is uh, the electorate can be manipulated. It can be manipulated by domestic axes. It can be manipulated by foreign axes. And what does this mean? It means that the outcomes of elections potentially are at risk because of manipulation uh, of uh, vulnerable audiences, uh, but equally, it also means that the process of election uh, of elections itself is also under attack. If you look at examples, and we don't have to rewind back into 2016 or 18 or 20, just the American midterms uh, in in um, well last year, uh, well, five or six months ago, we had cases where a conspiracy community in in the states was whipped up into such a state that they believe that mail-in ballots was the way in which uh, the, their elections were being hijacked. What this meant was these groups of conspiracists down to the state and county level started wanting to put ballot flares in ballot boxes. Now imagine about one of those ballot flares actually making it to a ballot box. It would mean whatever, 10,000 people, 20,000 people, potentially in that county, sometimes these are targeted, right, uh, would be disenfranchised. Um, in other cases, we've seen how foreign interference can play a, a critical role in elections. Again, there's no causal link has been proven uh, between how uh, what, what the Russians did and if it, if it uh, influenced any votes in, in 2016. But there was only 50,000 votes that controlled our election uh, in a country of 300 million people. And given the level of investment uh, that uh, they made uh, in, in uh, the, all the disinformation campaigns they uh, sowed then, it's pretty likely uh, they swung more than 50,000 votes. Again, we don't know in which direction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it's, it's highly likely that where we now live in a world where democracies have this inherent vulnerability in them that we're all trying to find ways in which we can mitigate. We have actors who are geopolitically motivated, politically motivated, and financially motivated to try and capitalize on these uh, vulnerabilities. And it's posing threats to what the outcome of elections can be, but also importantly into what fundamental election integrity is. Uh, people uh, who are conducting elections are being attacked, infrastructure enabling elections is being attacked, and things uh, like ballot boxes, et cetera. So it feels like a pretty, pretty material problem for uh, democracies to come together to solve. And to your point, it's not just the Indian and US elections in 24, it's the British elections, hey, they can, they can happen at a drop of a hat, but the UK elections are supposedly in 2024, the EU elections are in 2024, the German elections are in 2024. There's, 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 a, there's, a, there's, there's, there's quite a few elections in 2024. So it's the, it's the year of elections, and I think it's, it's a moment where uh, like-minded folks focused on technology for good and policy for good can come together to find solutions uh, uh, to this particular problem. Thanks. May I actually want to go next? I'm a lawyer, so I'm going to be a little bit legalese. I'll try not to be. So around 2002, 2005, the court was seized with a lot of criminalization of politics in India. 
And they thought at that time with the two judgments, one was ADR followed by PUCL, that a citizen has a right to make an informed choice. So they came out with a thing thinking that, you know, you make an informed choice, maybe we'll clean up our system. And they required all persons contesting the election to give a complete declaration about themselves, whether it was their tax returns or any pending criminal case, etc. But you know, in 2005, we didn't envisage what's going to happen to us in 2022. So in India, it started like, let me say sometime, the first time we took up something called paid news. I'm mm -hmm. sure many of you are journalists here and you understand what is that. So it had a very interesting thing. The court was not really looking into the paid news, which was Press Council of India was looking at that. But there was one lady who contested election from Uttar Pradesh and they found that two newspapers carried very similarly worded articles. And the press council gave a notice and they went to the press council and said, no, no, but this was an advertisement. This was not a news. And it had come out purportedly as a news in the newspaper. So the court took a notice of that. And because she hadn't shown that expense, now the court decided it on a level of her not declaring an expense for putting an advertisement, they disqualified her. The other one was Madhu Kora. They, he had a raid at his residence. They found some receipts. They pertain to planting some news in newspapers. And because he hadn't disclosed them, so he got disqualified in that process. But then we are talking, this is 2010, 11, and what culminated in 14. 2023, 24, and including from our last general election until now, the scene is entirely different. So it is, you may call it popularly fake news. It's actually no longer, it's a misnomer today. Because you have what is called disinformation, which some party sitting somewhere, whether it is within the country, outside the country, political party, whosoever who's interested, sets up this news content which targets or could target certain category of audience. That's then put into some kind of a domain. And a lot of idiots like me kind of maybe believe, and that is why we are called the idiot forwarders. <laughs> so that is then the misinformation. We verily believe in what is given to us. We consume it. And we become the generator of misinformation because we are the one who then transmit this misinformation on a large scale through our exchanges. And, you know, malinformation is not so much, but it does happen in a lot of elections, and which happens only where there is something which is private, which is never supposed to come into public domain. It is hacked. The news is true, but is put into a public domain just to put down a particular party. So you are now faced with all of these conditions and they are going to happen. They have happened in the previous elections. We divided ourselves on community lines, caste lines, religious lines in the previous elections we have. I think there is no need to shy away from saying that. I think time has come when we must recognize the use of social media can have a huge, huge impact on our democratic voting it is not going to be an informed choice that we will make if we rely only about what we are being fed in. Mm. Secondly, uh, do I have a moment? Yes. There is something called micro-targeting. All of you know about that. So you will have a news feed, only what you want to hear, because there's an algorithm that from your use of whatever you do on the net determines what you want to hear. And then it starts feeding you that kind of an information. It is now extremely important that we debate, we discuss, and we understand that we are not going to forward anything unless we are very sure about the content and that it's not a fake. And do not become idiot believers just to generate the whole thing of a misinformation. You know. You, it's going to be very hard to get a person who generates the disinformation. 
So we're going to come to but, that again. But we are the ones who propagate the that disinformation into a misinformation because we believe that it is perhaps true and then we transmit it. And I think that line for us in this debate is very important to understand and, and realize our responsibility not to spread that. So the responsibility is on the consumer, but we're going to ask very pointed questions of what big tech can do, but please go ahead. Uh, free and fair elections, I, I, I don't think there can be any cavil on that, but it's fundamental to any democracy. And the question is that can you have free and fair elections unless there is a fair dissemination of information and the public is actually informed? That essentially would be the question here. You have several instances where elections get truncated and by Dissemination of information which is actually not correct. Propaganda machines often operate in that way. And we've had several instances of fake news being circulated. And, 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 and to quote Gobel, you know, if a lie is uttered 99 times, people don't believe it. But if it is uttered 100 times, it is believed. So the first question is that can you have free and fair elections without the public being adequately informed and without the voter being adequately informed. And if we agree that it's not possible to have free and fair elections without the public being informed, then dissemination of information and the reach of the people to have the correct information is extremely necessary. Now, I want to break this up into two or three different parts in the sense that so far as the right to be informed is concerned, you have different classes in India of people. And our constitution, as has been said, was made more for the have-nots have than for the haves. So it was made for the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. It is necessary that therefore the reach of information is to each and every class or strata of society. And it is not truncated in a manner that certain classes of society only get certain limited information, which, which determines the mode or the manner in which you exercise the right to vote. So interestingly, there was a debate in the Constitution on adult franchise. And many of the uh, members of the Constituent Assembly, some of them, not the overwhelming majority, the overwhelming majority was in favor of adult franchise. But many said that, no, you must have limited franchise. And the argument towards limited franchise was that you only want to have an informed public, which is voting. Fortunately, that was repelled. But very interestingly, one of the uh, members of the Constituent Assembly made the point that now that you have adult franchise, it's very necessary that each and every member of the public is informed so that he makes an informed choice. So information and the right to information is extremely necessary. Now, we come to the, the, the freedom of speech and expression under Article 19.1a. But that has been interpreted also in several judgments of the court to say that this freedom doesn't only include your freedom of expression, but it also includes the access to information. So unless you have access to information, can you have informed expression? That's the other question. Now, coming to the context of elections, and I mean, if you break it up in the context of elections, then my, my view is that the election regime must be recognized by us to be sui generis, in the sense that it's very different. It's a very different sort of a regime which should operate at a time after elections are declared. And in that particular regime, you need more safeguards to ensure that elections are free and fair. So the election commission itself takes over several uh, functions which otherwise the state performs. For example, you have several government functionaries who are under the election commission, which is otherwise not so. 
Now, once that happens, I would suggest a mode or a mechanism whereby the election commission has some sort of power or some sort of superintendence even over the information which is put out generally in the public domain. Now, by this, I don't mean pre-censorship or anything of that kind. But often what we've seen is that when one particular polit political party, which is powerful, which has the money, etc., spins a certain narrative, there is a need to counter that narrative. And when that counter narrative is against what the state is trying to propagate, you have several coercive measures taken by the state in order to, to, to block that narrative. Now, examples of that are very uh, 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 well known in the sense that you've seen journalists being arrested. You've seen several uh, other persons or political workers being arrested merely because they spin out a narrative which is contrary to the narrative which probably the state would like. So what I would suggest is that the election commission should assume larger powers because Article 324 of the Constitution gives them the power of superintendence, gives them the power of control. And in, in exercise of those lo larger powers, steps should be taken to ensure that the all parties have a level playing field in terms of dissemination of information so that elections are indeed free and fair. So with that thought, I hand it over to you. So Lyric, you were speaking about midterm elections. And there's been a lot of reportage on that, the challenges that was uh, there. Um, there was a lot of scrutiny on big tech platforms on what they were doing to fix misinformation around elections, conspiracies around elections. Uh, do you want to share with our audience a bit on um, your views on whether you think uh, platforms rose up to the challenge? Uh, what were the key difficult areas that were difficult to kind of fix? Absolutely. Um tricky area. We work with some of them, so uh, I've got to be careful with what I say, but I'll try and be as candid as I can. Um, we, I think it's fair to say, in, in, in general, if you look at the evolution of the space, particularly since 2016, uh, platforms have been very slow to response, uh, respond. Uh, they almost went through the different stages of grief and were in, very much stuck in denial stage for about 18 months before... Uh, Things like Cambridge Analytica, et cetera, really hit home for them as being real burning issues that they need to do more on. So fast forward that into 2022, uh, I think it's important to understand the context in which platforms are now operating. Anything that they do is purely voluntary. There's no legal obligations that they have in terms of what they need to do or what they don't need to do uh, in terms of online content moderation or in the way in which they run their trust and safety operations. So. Uh, for someone who's doing things voluntarily, yeah, they're, they're, you can salute everything that they do in this space as being uh, potentially a good step. But given the disproportionate kind of control and benefit uh, that they have uh, by the role that they play in our information environment, there's always a case for them to do more, both in the absence of regulations and uh, hopefully in a world where there's kind of sensible and proportionate regulations that are applied to platforms in, in, in this space. So specifically in, in 2022, what did what did what, what what was happening and what did platforms do? We were no longer in a place where foreign actors were using content farms to originate narratives. We were in a place that was a incredibly polarized country, where especially on the extreme fringes, uh, there were conspiracy movements that effectively were doing that for whatever nation state. So we had a world where domestically these communities that, for whatever reason, believe certain things, uh, continue to believe certain things. And we had nation states applied on top of that who were kind of sprinkling a little dose of bots and a little dose of coordinated and inauthentic behavior on top of existing narratives that were gaining traction within certain communities to some objective. Again, we can, we can try and predict what those objectives, et cetera, were. So to counter this, what did platforms do? Uh, very little. Uh, some more than others, I, sh I, sh I should say. Uh, generally, uh, when you look at platforms, it's probably pretty well known in the, in the space that Meta does more than most, but they probably should, given they're the biggest uh, that, that's out there. Um, they, they invest in, uh, in things like supercharging their fact-checking programs, uh, having this kind of election integrity partnership uh, with various organizations to research elections, et cetera, better. But fundamentally, there wasn't a lot of coordination uh, the, bet between platforms 
and between platforms and government uh, to do something about the space. The point I'm really getting to here is that each platform was trying to protect their own little walled garden, some with slightly bigger gardens, but uh, and they did maybe a good job in some cases and a bad job in other cases, but that kind of mindset where everyone was just tending to their backyard just left the front door open uh, because you could kind of uh, focus on emerging platforms like a Gab and a Telegram, et cetera, seed narratives there, uh, uh, mobilize people uh, to make sure that the second it lands on a, on a meta or a Twitter, it was going to go viral from day one. And even if platforms' response times were incredibly good, say they responded in the first half hour or hour, it was still too slow because whatever damage had to be done got done. Got done. But there's, there's this one complaint that people have that, and I want your views on that, that platforms are likely to act or at least be seen to act when it comes to the US or Western democracies. But you don't see that kind of um, willingness or, uh, you know, uh, you don't see that kind of action when it comes to the global south with India or other countries. How fair do you think that criticism is? Um, if you try and... You think it's more... In part, yes, probably. Uh, I think it's 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 a challenging environment for them to operate in as well, right? So if you zoom back down into 2020, they kicked the probably the most powerful person on earth off their platform, a sitting president of the United States of the, their platform. That's a but pretty, that's the US. Would they do that in India? That's a pretty bold move. Again, <laughs> it depends on uh, the context of what the individual did. But again, that's a move that pretty widely is now criticized by most in, in this space of saying, hey, yeah, that, that probably made the problem worse. Mm. And that, again, is speaking to this walled garden mentality where they thought by kicking uh, the former president off their platform, the world was going to be a better place or the US democracy was going to be in, in a better place. And upon reflection, it probably isn't. Uh, platforms like Gab, Truth, et cetera, have taken off. They've probably uh, led to kind of more extremist, more <laughs> radical narratives, et cetera, being promoted. And guess what? It's not Trump on that platform anymore, but uh, dozens and tens of thousands of micro influencers are still on, on these major platforms that are still promoting the same narratives. So I think we've, we've got to be very careful whenever we're taking any action in the space in terms of, all right, what, what step is proportionate, but also likely to be effective. And unfortunately, we don't have a, have a lot of data on that. Mm. But there is, there is low-hanging fruit. Um, for instance, what they did do a, a, a better job on was areas that were kind of politically less ambiguous. So areas where there was threats explicitly to election officials. Uh, we, we worked uh, with, 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 with a number of election bodies in 2020 and in 2022, and the step change we saw in platforms engagement levels was, was pretty, was, was good, was, was a mark, in, was, was a step in the right direction. Still not perfect, uh, but I think by focusing on those low hanging fruit areas, it's probably one of the ways in which we can start making progress in the space while we still try and understand what we could do potentially about political mis and disinformation online uh, or even kind of uh, unauthorized political advertising online. They, they seem slightly more contentious space mm. spaces, but it feels like platforms, government, civil society, and the general public can come together uh, on, on what is low hanging fruit. Things like threats to election officials, threats to election infrastructure, foreign interference. No, 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 no sensible person wants that. Uh, and rumors such as, hey, your election's been moved from place A to place B. And your or, name's been struck off. Et cetera. So like it, it, which it, you it, see a lot in India. And those, those feel like low-hanging fruit areas where they've started to make progress. But uh, in, in my view, a more joined up whole of industry approach is needed where uh, all the major platforms, emerging platforms collaborate both with each other and with government uh, for, for, for a more kind of thoughtful solution as opposed to tending to their own back garden. I mean, actually, in the Indian context, we don't have a legal definition for fake news. We don't have legislation that specifically targets misinformation. But we do have an election commission. So to, in your view, uh, what do we need right now? Do we need legislation around this issue? Do we need to define what fake news is and then come up with a new set of laws? Or do we need to strengthen election commission uh, to handle misinformation on social media? So yes, election commission has the powers, as Josefa just said. As of now, the powers that it has exercised is more like uh, screening the advertisements, screening the opinion polls, you know, once they are done. But that's also, the law says, not 48 hours before, and no exit polls till such time. But if you're putting in political advertisements, it does have the power to scrutinize, to screen them. Having said that, Election Commission has not really done much about 
paid news we know was an outcome of certain other circumstances which was not having disclosed in your returns in your accounts but as such there is a huge need today to deal with this part of disinformation and misinformation and there is a need to when you realize that it is circulating it has to be nipped in the bud hmm. now there is going to be a huge challenge and uh, you know if you have a strong election commission perhaps you would have the action but remember that over history we've had election commissioners who were very strong whether it was session or it was lindo but we also had election commissioners who were not very strong now that leaves you in a slightly vulnerable area if you say leave only to election commission to use its powers during the course of the election when it has all the powers at that time there is no doubt so what perhaps what you need is a reinforced legislation number 1 number 2 from what i have been reading a little bit because my idea about all your platforms is not so great i'm one more a lawyer than a person into technology but see it's a very fine divide between curbing freedom of speech for a free and fair election and at the same time say this is a disinformation and i'm going to curb it mm. so a lot of jurisdictions are having that problem including yours what is the test what is the proportionality test that you are going to apply and say now this is wrong and this has to go out immediately while the elections are on so that is a matter of debate worldwide including the united nations has now come out with certain guidelines to determine on that but i having gone through them i don't think they are really very the same but european union has come together with this guideline and one thing that they have stopped is a foreign interference in their election domain so they are very categorical for example uh, i think netherlands had to have signed some documentation with ukraine and there was suddenly a viral thing which came up on one of the ukrainian medias and then circulated all over netherlands showing that they were burning the the dutch flag or they had done something against netherlands mm -hmm. immediately they stopped that they stopped they said this cannot go irrespective of whatever be your freedom of expression before you know whether it's fake or not it would have done a lot of damage so country small countries like latvia took a position to stop down rt channels in their country sputnik and the same thing is happening in britain now because they do not want a foreign interference but remember what you are doing is you are exercising that power going against a freedom of expression when it's a foreign channel hmm. what do you but do when it's what would you do when it's, when it's a within. domestic because then you start applying the law you look at the proportionality you look whether i can censor i think there is a need to have now a very clear outline whether you call it a small policy format or you you may not have a legislation before the next election but have clear set of guidelines that if there is something like this and it is harming like as josefa said free and fair election nip it in the bud at that time we will test everything later on but the counter voice must not be stopped so that's the very fine mm. divide in a freedom of expression and censorship that will come to protect free and fair election that's a huge debate by itself and i think what you're also saying is that when governments this decide they can push platforms to crack down and i think one example that comes to my mind listening to all of you is 2019 elections after the pulwama terror attack there was this viral whatsapp message uh, about a congress leader senior congress leader paying um, the suicide attackers family and saying that uh, we're going to you know uh, get all the stone pelters out of the jail if you voted to pa and of course this is fake news but this was viral and i'm pretty certain that if you still talk to people a lot of people may believe still believe that so this thing of nipping it in the bud and curtailing it and the level playing field that you spoke about is is this even possible because it seems so hard you know because this is happening on multiple whatsapp channels on telegram now you even have youtube channels that mimic news anchors and you know they just spout fake information completely so 
<clears throat> I would answer this by saying that you have to understand the regime of elections very different from the normal regime. See, once elections are declared, you have a sui generis kind of a regime which comes in, where you have several, several kinds of information which are disseminated with the purposes of influencing the electorate. So it is very different from normal times. Like the example that you gave about Fulmama is something which happened during normal times. Mm. But the election regime is very different. So if, if we focus on this concept of free and fair elections, my view is that the election commission must be empowered to do what, whatever it takes under the constitution in conformity with fundamental rights in order to ensure that free and fair elections take place. Now, coming back to this aspect of fake news, I mean, and what we've seen is that during an election, the entire disinformation is very systemic hmm. in the sense that it comes from very, often it comes from very organized platforms. It comes in the form of a barrage and it's very, very difficult to insert, intercept it at that particular stage. And by the time you intercept it and you stop it, the penny is already dropped. People have already voted. So the best way of being able to counter it is to ensure that the counter narrative also has a level playing field. I don't think it's possible to intercept and completely block it. I am not a technological person. I am a lawyer. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for, for, for others Lyric. to sort of debate. <laughs> but it will be very, very difficult because these, these things are systemic in nature. So it will be very difficult to intercept it within such time that it doesn't influence the electorate. My concern is that often I've seen that during elections or, or even during normal times, the state tends to block the other narrative and tends to take down the other narrative. So anyone who puts up a counter narrative to the narrative of the state, the effort is to then use extremely coercive met methods to shut, them down. to shut them down, take them down, arrest them, put them in jail and so on and so forth. So I'm saying, since, since our focus is on elections, treat that as a se separate regime. And even the power of arrest, even the power of takedown, the election commission must have control over it. For example, I would go so far as to say that you, you shouldn't be allowed to arrest a journalist or a political worker without taking sanction from the election commission during this particular period. Because it's very, very necessary to maintain the integrity of the elections. Even, even uh, election-related cases which have a nexus with elections, everything should be in the domain, prosecution of those cases, arrest by officers. Even that person who sits in the ministry, who is in charge of takedown, during that period must be in the direct control of the election commission. Be open for the election commission to say, I substitute him for some other officer. So, I personally feel that's the way forward in the sense that if you can't block it at the entry point, allow, allow a free hand to even the counter narrative. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's very difficult to, to figure out as to who's the person who's actually responsible for dissemination of fake news and who this particular narrative helps. Now, sometimes it, that narrative may be spun by an opposition party. So equally, the party in power also must have and level playing field to be able to put out a counter narrative of its own. But put it at least during this election regime period, put it under the election commission. Don't, don't let it travel outside because the state is bound to be partisan when it comes to election. So very quickly, I'm told we're running out of time, but I just want a quick intervention from Lyric. This thing of really tough to nip it in the bud. Uh, is it really tough with AI and with tech or is it just a question of big platforms not wanting to upset people who they're going to have to do business with? There's an inherent conflict of interest. It's definitely difficult. Uh, there's a lot of challenges, right? Um, it's not just, especially in India, uh, content's multilingual, it's multimodal, not just text, images, videos, memes, all different kinds, and it's cross-platform. So it's, it's not, again, fair for, for, one, for one platform to do. Uh, in principle, can it be done? Yes. In practice, can it be done? Yes. Uh, again, it's been proven a number of times. Uh, for instance, uh, again, not in the election context, but in, in the Ukraine-Russia context currently, 
uh, again, some of the Ukraine's response has been pretty, pretty impactful and pretty successful. All Russian infrastructure that was supporting, uh, or a significant proportion of it certainly, has been, has been taken down. Um, and again, it comes back to the argument of what does good look like? And this isn't just an answer that we need to solve for India, it's, it's an answer that we need to solve for the world, which is, we, we, and we, we just need to acknowledge, we, in a lot of cases we don't know, but in, in, in quite a few cases we do. Um, one, one, one thing that you mentioned earlier uh, uh, was really interesting around this framing of kind of idiots. There, that actually is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a TTP uh, of, of Russian disinformation called the construct of a useful idiot. And actually, as we have some journalists in the room, uh, journalists are specifically targeted by uh, organized campaigns, be it domestic actors or nation states. Again, they, they, they're not being cahoots with uh, whoever this third party is, but to publish on certain things. Why? Because, hey, Journalists, we, we, uh, people like journalists like being on Twitter, and hey, we come across something on Twitter and publish it, right? <laughs> so, um, again, th this is a technical narrative laundering, um, and it's it's known TCP of disinformation. So, uh, one of the cases we make is in the context of elections. Again, let's draw the line. Um, perhaps not covering political speech. Let's let, let let's have that be a protected a protected class of speech. But outside of that, all information. We probably don't even need to care about the concept of truthiness. This might be a provocative statement, but we probably don't care about the concept of truthiness. Because if we see one of these TTPs out there in the wild, one of these items of the playbook out there in the wild, let's call it for what it is. It's disinformation. It's, it's an attempt by someone, we don't know who it is, uh, out there to manipulate audiences through a known technique. Uh, and this also brings in an element of objectivity uh, into the equation because, hey, you either see it or you either don't. And again, truthiness is a really hard concept to wrangle with. And again, that, 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 that's more in the misinformation space. But in our view, I think if we focus on the TTPs, the organized actor, ABC, be a domestic, foreign, whatever, extremist group, political party, whatever, if, if a TTP is being used, that is inherently deceptive, i.e. Uh, the person promoting a piece of information wants to hide who they are, use bots, techniques like narrative laundering, etc. Let's take down those, that infrastructure. We don't necessarily need to take the tech content down. We certainly need to, don't need to go arrest journalists. Let's just take down whatever infrastructure, accounts, narratives, mm -hmm. content was used uh, to uh, coordinate such campaigns. You know, it's very hard to take it down immediately. It spreads like a wildfire. It goes viral. And therefore, the, the, the news gets disseminated. The disinformation gets disseminated to large number. But one thing that you can do within a reasonable frame of time, the minute you recognize that this is a disinformation, I think, as Josefa said, election commissions have the authority. In every country, they do have a large, very strong authority. There must be an obligation to go on a media blitz saying, this what is circulating around is not correct for reasons A, B, C. So once you start doing a counter offensive of that kind, and at least coming out and saying, and even if you did 15 or 20 of them, people who put it there know that this could backfire whomsoever it is intended to promote, because disinformation is targeted to promote one against the other. And uh, you know, if, if one would work around that and do an equal, media blitz through the official channel, say this particular news is not correct for this, this reason, maybe it will have some degree because it's not otherwise possible to control the way it spreads. Great, so we're gonna take some questions from the audience. So good evening everyone, my name is Shivanshu. I'm from Jammu and I'm studying computer engineering. So uh, my question is to everyone. So considering that uh, Twitter is now giving out uh, verified badges for like 700, 800 rupees a month, and uh, even Instagram, Facebook are trying to do that going forward. So don't you think that it'll increase the, like make the cycle of misinformation even worse? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, Elon's got a lot of great ideas, but this might be a great idea commercially, but again, this is another TCP, potentially a bad actor. If they were looking to manipulate a platform, great, let's just go buy a verified tick. And now we're verified and we can spread info and great, some limits on uh, how many ads, et cetera, you can place, get removed, et cetera, as well. So, yeah, uh, I think, it, it, again, with all these things, the way in which platform, like what is a platform's business model, right? They, they, they need more time on platform from you, et cetera, et cetera. They need, they need to monetize you. 
uh, and your time over, over, over a period of time. So a lot of what they do is to find ways in which they can either directly monetize you or indirectly monetize you. Um, and generally, there will be challenges that are posed with that business objective and the objective of trust and safety and the objective that they, like legal obligation that they need to have where they have a duty of care both to protect uh, their users from kind of individual harms, of course, but also these societal harms. And there's, there's examples of kind of good, uh, well, hopefully what turns out to be good regulation, like the, uh, the, the Online Safety Bill, Digital um, Services Act. Again, there's some, some whispers of similar legislation potentially in, in uh, India as well uh, that we think uh, could, be, could be helpful in allowing platforms to do more, but also to have kind of greater risk assessments in place before someone thinks of uh, a feature like this uh, that they want to push through. Maybe we can take two quick questions, you and then. Um, thank you so much. So my question is actually, it's something which News Laundry also covered this Gujarat elections that uh, some of the parties uh, were, uh, the uh, media was actually told not to cover some of the parties. So how do you co uh, counter that narrative? Because that is not something which is legally imposed on them, but it is just a direction given by the ruling state. So how do you counter that narrative? Following up from the question on technology control, so a lot of narrative or fake information regulates or uh, gets promoted in India via WhatsApp private conversations. So what can technology do without interfering too much on the privacy aspect? So legal plus technological solution on that. I mean, those questions actually, I don't know if there's an answer. We take the right answer. We're basically talking about the fact that there was, there was some reporting, there was some yes, rumors even around the fact that media organizations or courts could not report on certain parties. Then I guess the media just have to stand up. I don't know. There's no legal um, solution to that. <laughs> it's an ethical problem and it's a yeah. yeah, it's not something that we can do you want to take the privacy question sure. and then we'll come to you? Absolutely. Uh, this is actually an interesting one because the first time we ever did something on this was actually in India. Uh, so it was during the 2019 uh, elections in Maharashtra. We worked uh, closely with WhatsApp to understand how we might be able to first, without breaking uh, uh, encryption, identify uh, misleading uh, and potentially uh, malicious information uh, that's going through their network by leveraging effectively user intent. Uh, so what, what I mean by that is we, we, we built a, um, uh, uh, an automated fact sharing service on, on top of WhatsApp so where users can voluntarily share uh, anything that they suspect as potential misinformation. Uh, so what we found was actually quite surprising. The concept of the tip line, et cetera, has existed for a few years. This was one of the first places where we tried to automate it and we got some pretty surprising uh, reactions from it. First off, if we're able to respond to users within half an hour, uh, so if it's fully automated or, again, there's enough capacity uh, and there's, you know, tens of thousands of fact checkers out there in the world, uh, if, if we respond within 30 minutes, the rate at which that user is more likely to share more misinformation with you is kind of about five times higher. And the likelihood that they share whatever the fact check is within the WhatsApp network, usually back the direction the original misinformation or disinformation came from, was 11 times more likely. So... This was an interesting finding. Again, we, we, again, this isn't self absolutely We're not working on that anymore. So uh, uh, it's, 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 I think, an example where, uh, yes, there are te inherent tensions between security and privacy. But it's a, it's, 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 it's a way in which, while not compromising on privacy, we can leverage kind of large crowds, user intent, to identify misinformation, but also use the same network that malicious actors use to promote disinformation, just spin the network on itself and use that same network to expose fact checks and reliable information to folks that have uh, seen uh, uh, the underlying misdis. So uh, again, certain ideas like these are being tried out, but generally, uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a challenge in the space. And there, there, there are no perfect answers, unfortunately. Well, uh, my question is uh, that since I'm researching also on similar topic related to elections, uh, that uh, uh, should there be a model code of conduct like for, like there is for political party? Should there be for the, uh, generalist as well during the uh, during the election election period by the election commission or would that violate the boundaries of free speech uh, during elections? Is that feasible, desirable? 
Not at all. <laughs> Uh, to cut the minutes of fake news. You are one of the pillars of democracy. An independent media is one of the main pillars of a democracy. And if we start imposing restrictions on their speech, and I, and I do hope that speech is independent, and they have the spine to stand up for what is required to be said, but the minute you start curtailing the journalists from speaking, you would have you would have demolished one very important part which stands for the democracy. So model code of conduct is very good about a money that you're carrying and that you're paying and that you won't carry out advertisements, you won't carry out your campaigns from this to this hour, all very well. But I think where it comes to freedom of speech and, in, and expression, so far as it's the truth and it's a fair information disseminated to public, Please don't even ask for a mortal code of conduct to intrude into your rights. No, no, in case of fake news, I was in context of fake news. So see, the way I would answer it is this. When you have a model code of conduct which kicks in, in the context of parties, etc., I agree with Minakshi, there can be no model code of conduct by journalists. But I think it's necessary for the election commission to issue general directives to ensure that there is adequate dissemination of information which ensure that elections are free and fair, that every, every section of society gets, gets, gets its, 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 uh, it, its uh, an opportunity to be able to portray its point of view. Now, when you do that and when you have fake news in that domain, you can generally have guidelines so as to control you know, fake news, et cetera, vested in the election commission, not specific to journalists, but specific across the board to all political parties, to each and every person involved in the collection, in the, this thing of, uh, of information. And I would say that if today a particular news channel or, or if a particular this thing is running its programs in a manner so as to unduly influence an election, then you should vest some power in the election commission during that limited period. But you must have regard to ensure that unless this doesn't impinge on free speech under Article 19.1a, that you don't restrict it too much, because that's also necessary for the conduct of a free and fair election. So a balance has to be struck. I mean. Great. Thank you so much. We're completely out of time, so we can't take any more questions. But thank you so much for staying with us.